everybody. This is the One Hour Photo Podcast by Studio C41, and I'm Bill Manning. Today, we have a very special episode. Uh, we have uh, a guest on that has been really into creating a new product that this film industry desperately needs. And uh, we are seeing some products that are coming in, and uh, we have our first major film scanner that is coming out of Europe. And that is Valoy. So, Arlid, how are you doing, sir? Hi, hi, I'm good. Thanks. How are you doing? Doing all right, doing right. So uh, right. I'm really excited about this product. You guys are right on the edge of getting um, uh, Valoy uh, funded. Uh, you guys are just uh, under $8,000, I believe, to get funded. And that is an incredibly exciting thing. So first of all, I want to kick off this episode and say a very special congratulations to you. Um, so I'm, I'm cheering for you to get across that finish line and hopefully this episode, uh, we can, uh, you know, encourage some of the listeners that may have some questions about Valoy and, uh, we can actually, uh, address some of those. So, um, before we do and get into all of that, let's a little hear, let's hear a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no. So thank you. That's, uh, that's very generous and hopefully we can address some of the questions. And there's a lot of, I think I must have answered 200 questions the past two weeks of um, <laughs> specific about this product. So there's a lot of questions about it and kind of understandably we're a, it's a Kickstarter and so it, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of not quite settled. The dust hasn't quite settled around this product. So there's still still a lot to, uh, to explore. There's a lot to talk about. But yeah, uh, me. So I'm, um, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a student. I, I'm a student of linguistics. So not really related to, to photography or related to, uh, to product design or industrial design or mm -hmm. manufacturing or any of that. Uh, but yeah, essentially, uh, so I'm from Norway, uh, currently I'm living in, in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and essentially, I think just about the time I, I started university uh, four years ago, I got into photography. I had my first digital camera. Uh, and then I think I think within probably five months of buying my first digital camera, I, I read this book and this book had this character and this character had this camera and this camera was a uh, Leica 3C. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, oh, cool. What's that? Um, because that's that's how I've been all my life. Like, I don't know what that is. Let's let's look that up. And it was in a historic setting. And I thought it was it would the way it was describing it was pretty cool. So I started mm -hmm. look, uh, researching cameras and then uh, sure enough, like a month later, I think I bought my first, I think it was about a month later, I bought my, my first camera, film camera, real camera. That's a quick uh, adjustment. A <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, uh, it, it took me about five or six years before I bought my first film camera. So five months, that's, that's crazy. So <laughs> what, for, what was the camera that you first got? It was like a three C. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first film camera is a Leica that I, I like your style, sir. Very cool. Very I mean, cool. I mean, so yeah. Okay. So sure. It's a Leica. It sounds a bit posh, but it wasn't <laughs> that much money at the time. No, no judgments <laughs> over here. It's, they are fantastic cameras. Um, and I think any of the people that are the Leica haters, they're just jealous. So sorry guys. Um, but no, that's, that's fantastic. Um, what kind of like, what kind of, spurred you into you know you got the digital and then you got the film and it's like you know what was that connection that you made going okay i really am digging shooting film so my first experience was so i took off this camera and i just uh it got in the mail like on monday and on thursday i was flying out so i was living in edinburgh still living in edinburgh and on thursday i was flying out to vienna uh i was staying in vienna for for a month for a german German course at the university mm -hmm. and, and I'd just gotten this camera and I'd loaded my first roll of film into it but I hadn't actually gotten anything back from it so I was kind of like well let's let's bring it down first so I brought that and like a selection of of films I think I had four different like four films and they were all different <laughs> <laughs> so I think in the first week and a half of, of staying in Vienna I just sort of uh, so I've been before, but I, I really like the city, but uh, I sort of just walked around and, and took pictures of buildings and tourist sites and, and just like stuff on the street uh, trying to get. So I was 
quite familiar with the concepts of like aperture and shutter speeds and ISO. So I understood the basics, yeah. but I didn't like film was was completely different. So I was using this light beta on my phone and and the app on my phone and 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 just sort of yeah. Um, so one of the things yeah. that got me really hooked was that um, particularly on this one market, this big market in Indiana called Nashmarkt, and the on that market I was it was a uh, it's open every Sunday I think and um and they uh, um they, there's tons of people and tons of stalls and it's very chaotic and stuff but I was walking around with my little Leica and and took some pictures of stalls and some people and and like things in the market and every like 10 minutes this some some guy usually a guy let's let's face it uh would would like look at me and like ooh like nod like some some people would say like, oh nice, nice camera and, and but some people would just like nod and sort of yeah yeah i know that's cool uh, <laughs> uh that was my first sort of getting hooked and the other i think was uh so there was a lab just down the street where i was staying and and i walked down there and and, and sort of in my broken german said that i want to do my thumb my film developed from exactly familiar vocabulary um and and like three days later i came back and they gave me a, a usb stick with my film scanned on it and it was black and white and they just looked really cool they just yeah so i was shooting a like a 3c with a, a 50 millimeter almar 3.5 um in on like grainy i think i was shooting hp5 and probably a t-max maybe a 400 mm. um and and they just came back looking fantastically vintage the lens was was yeah. not in the best condition it looked it looked really good <laughs> oh that's really cool uh, so that was kind of my first like oh 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 no i'm hooked <laughs> <laughs> well that's so, very yeah. very cool I, and and uh that is a that's an awesome story to hear because everybody has their own story as far as how they got into film and it's really exciting to hear um uh that a uh, memorable trip uh resulted in some great images so that's really cool so you got into film for a while and in through through college or anything so you're in your last year of university correct so four years for you guys yeah. right yeah that's it same here um well yeah. it's supposed to be yeah. four years over here so it took me a little bit longer but um uh you're a linguist and then you got into uh creating valoid so let I'm really interested in hearing how this path, like, you know, uh, in my last interview with Joe Greer, college really defines us as who we are, not necessarily professionally, right? You know, I think it certainly builds a foundation of who we are going to be when we get older. So I'm I'm really interested in hearing about uh, your the path that you're about to take and and creating a product that has nothing to do with um being a linguist right you know so you're creating something that's really interesting and I, i'd like to hear a little bit more about valoy yeah i mean so yeah it really does not have anything to do with being a linguist uh, I'm, I'm a theoretical linguist it's, it's not it's not vaguely related um i think in my case it's it's not so much university that's formed me because my degree has been very my degree life has been very separate from from this photography life that's been very much like my own go out and do it on my own I'm, mm -hmm. this is this is just me I grew up in northern Norway and was given a knife at a really young age probably five or six mm -hmm. and that sounds crazy to at least some of my friends say I think it sounds crazy uh, <laughs> sort of defined that defined a lot of, of my childhood and, and and growing up in in my teens I was doing woodworking and and sort of all through my life, I've been doing things with my hands, crafts or crafts or mm -hmm. uh, just using my hands for anything I could, I could, I could do it really. And yeah, so doing this, uh, I started getting into film and I was, uh, I was uh, scanning my film in, because I was a student, I couldn't really, oh, I am a student, I couldn't really afford mm -hmm. um, fancy scanning shows. Um, and so I had, I developed my own black and white film, uh, in my, in my bathroom, mm -hmm. much to the detriment of my, of my flatmates, but there we are. <laughs> and I was scanning it. The university, the university had a, 
I think it was a Canon 9000 F Mark II. It's a flatbed scanner, essentially. It's a bit older than the, mm-hmm. the modern Epson scanners, but um, a lot of people might know those. It could scan medium format and, and 35 millimeter, but the 35 millimeter scanning was, oh, it was so slow. Oh. <laughs> I, I spent, so it's in the library. I think I, I often got there really early in the morning, so no one would take the spot with the scanner. Often there would just be some annoying kid, like writing, typing away on the computer or something. Like, you're not <laughs> using this guy, can um, so I got there really early in the morning, and I would start scanning my film, and I probably, like, two rolls, I probably wouldn't be, two or three rolls, I wouldn't be done before noon. Wow. Um, so that, that's, that was my first experience, sort of, doing my own film I did, I did that for quite a while but then sometime last year a combination of noise is Norway so shooting film there is pretty it's pretty neat looks pretty mm-hmm. um, so I do a lot of nature nature landscape stuff in uh, in Norway and um, a combination of moving between two places, which a flatbed scanner isn't exactly ideal for. Uh, so I either had to have two or just accept that I wouldn't be scanning my films anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, or I would just be scanning my film one of the places. Um, and just the the really slow nature of flatbed scanners made me maybe just look for something else. So I was looking at, you know, pack-ons and mm, various yeah. old scanners. But at some point, I must have come across. Um, I'm not sh- quite sure which one happened first, but I think I realized that this, like, I had this digital camera, which I wasn't very using very much at this point. But I think I must have realized my own, like, this. Surely you must be able to just photograph the negative, and then probably went online and, and saw that yeah, indeed, people do that, mm-hmm. and I clearly had been doing that for a while. Um, so that's sort of where I started, mm-hmm. and then I looked at like what are the challenges so leveling things is is difficult and lighting things is quite difficult but all of them sort of had their own solution uh, but then i came to holding film flat and the best alternative i could find really was taping it down which is pretty it's a pretty grim alternative mm-hmm. um so at that point the pixelator hadn't come out yet it was announced and, and the kickstarter was funded but it wasn't out in in the wild right and the alternatives were pretty slim i had a lomography digital ISA for a while because student budget again that sure. was I don't know, they are 20 30 40 dollars i don't know what they are in the us yep um, so i had that for a while for medium format and 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 used it but it was it was pretty slow mm-hmm. it would take me at least as long to get through a roller film on that as it would be on, on epson yep so at some point um oh yeah and then um, COVID came around and my university was, so this is um, February. I sort of realized, okay, it's going to, they're going to shut it down, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so in, I think in very early March, I left, um, I left the UK, went back to Norway because I was expecting Norway to be better off. And I was expecting, especially in Northern Norway, where there are more moose than people. Um, <laughs> and and I expected, um, so I was also at this point, I'd also been invited to intern for camera rescue in Finland. Oh, cool. And at least on the same continent, not on the island, uh, made it seem easier to, to get to Finland than yeah. from, from Norway than, than getting that to it from the UK. Um, yeah, so at this in this period in, in March and April, I didn't have that much to do university had decided they didn't they they're not very quick they're pretty slow at at moving moving stuff around and and making Mm. okay exams can't happen well what do we do then uh don't know let's whatever they'll they'll be they'll be fine so there were no exams and no assignments or no nothing Mm -hmm. so i just sort of sat at home and and didn't have that much to do at first and then i started so because I've been really interested in working with my hands and, and making things and, and doing that kind of thing, I've always been interested in, for as long as I've known about it, uh, 3D modeling. Yep. So I'm looking for a pro- project to sort of teach myself 3D modeling because I had all this time on my hands. Let's let's use it for something. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I started doing that. Um, and so Fusion, Fusion 360 is, is free for like home use. So I downloaded that and, and watched some YouTube videos and then went, hmm, made a few models of sort of things on my desk, measuring them with calipers and, and drawing them out. And that was all fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, then I thought about this, um, this holder problem that I had because yeah. I think I had a, I think I had a little wish list of like camera scanning product products because I'd been reading about them a lot, um, but I couldn't afford any of them. And I think, I think the total bill racked up to like three and a half thousand dollars or something wow. for for like a full kit. Um, that's that's what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I was just that wasn't going to happen. Um, so I started modeling like, oh, how could we, how could I do this? And I started measuring like angles uh, for making sure that the holder didn't interfere with the with the lens or the the optical path that you see through the lens. So what you see through the lens, the holder didn't encroach on what you see through the lens and rising the film off the off the uh, light source and sort of all the things that you need to to make a a film holder I started looking into and and I think if you watched a Kickstarter video um, there's a section in there where um, I think close to the end you see eight or ten iterations of of sort of 3D models <laughs> uh, and those were the ones I were working on back in in March and right. April and early May maybe um, yeah so I got to got to that point and got to a sort of prototyping I need to start testing this if I want to do it any further. And 3D printing was an obvious option, but not really an option that's very accessible in Norway. So I don't have a 3D printer myself because I'm not living sort of Mm. permanently anywhere. And um, for some reason, living in the UK, it's quite easy to have access to to commercial 3D printers. But in Norway, people do it. It's a small country. There's people who do it, but they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. So the model was like... $80, $90 $80, to print this basic basic model and have it shipped. Um, mm-hmm. And I wasn't really, at that point, I wasn't really planning to make it like a product. So I wasn't thinking about them like prototyping costs. I was just like, this is money I could spend on film. Mm-hmm. Or something. Um, so I started looking into laser cutting. Uh, so CNC, um, yeah, uh, laser cutting acrylic is actually a really cheap way of, of making parts. And I started trying to make this so essentially what I've done now, but so what the Kickstarter is, but out of acrylic, which is surprisingly difficult because everything is in 2D and you have to put things together. And yeah. So for a while I was I was prototyping in that and uh, and sort of laid out the foundations and the, the shape and the rollers and I even managed to make uh, holders with S curves in them. So there's oh, cool. there's a few uh, holders on the market with uh, that are made of this material, but they don't they use a flat track. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I found a way to, to flip it around and, and make an S curve track for it. Um, and then I went to Finland and the project was kind of dead for a month. I was talking to Joho about it and I was mm-hmm. talking to a couple of the guys working in Finland and obviously they're knowledgeable and they know their film. But uh, yeah, not, not that much happened. Uh, I was talking to... to yeah, I was talking to a few people and, and people seemed to think it was a good idea. And if you could make it sort of cheaply enough, it'd be, it would be fit well into the market. Um, so when I got back from Finland, I started, um, I'd sort of decided, okay, let's see if we can make this, make this work. And, and today we have some really good quoting tools, online quoting tools for manufacturer. Um, Exometry and 3D hubs both have like, Re, um, you you get the model and they'll you select a material and the manufacturing method and and they'll spit out a number for you and this is how much it costs right. and then you can order it and they'll send it to some manufacturer that can, can do it for that cost. Uh, so it's a really good way of even though you don't order through them, it's a really good way of um, sort of finding out what works and what's cheap. Yeah. So combining that with some knowledge from from a couple of friends to do similar things, I put together this, so essentially this um, prototype that is in the videos and all, all of the, the physical prototype that's that's in all the content I've made, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, it's a sheet metal aluminium frame 
and CNC um, holders on top. And, and it worked really well. So I got that in, yeah, sometimes sometime late in the summer and, and it worked really well. Um, but then we sort of looked around and it was, it was, I could have made that commercially viable at the same price as some of the, some of the, the top, sure. uh, some of the most expensive holders right. on the market. Um, that would have been, that would have been fine. But that wasn't really the point. Um, I set out to do this because I'm a student, because I couldn't afford those holders. Right. So I was going to make something. I wanted to make it affordable while also, um, I'm, um, I guess you could say I'm a high end user. I, I care about the, the really, I care about scanning quickly and I care about scanning with on flat film and getting good results. But I, I wasn't ready to pay off that money. So sure. if I was going to actually waste people's money and uh, and produce a product, I wanted it to be more affordable than, than what was on the market currently, sure. while also so retaining the features that I thought were most important. Um, so that's about the time when Yuho introduced me to the engineer that's working on the project, Vihar. He's a mechanical engineer, got his degree in, in the Netherlands and has been working in the UK for a for a company um doing lasers mm -hmm. and um yeah so and and yuho had talked to him because he's he's a camera geek and he was looking at doing some work for camera rescue and um he said hey this guy is maybe interesting for you maybe you should have a chat so we did have a chat mm -hmm. and uh after the drawings and we agreed okay maybe you can maybe you can draw the drawings just redraw them and, and make them do what I've done, but make them better drawings that we can. Mm. And one of the things with, with doing 3D modeling is that uh, you can make good drawings and then you can make less good drawings. And my drawings were definitely in the, I started doing this a year ago. I'm not that great. <laughs> um, and his drawings are like, I'm professional. I know what's up. Um, sure. So he redrew, redrew the thing and, and, as through that sort of learned the design and, and we had long talks about how it works and what it does. Um, and he was sort of keen enough to spend a lot of time on it. And, and eventually he started just suggesting things himself. It was like, what about if you do this? And what if you do injection molding? Mm -hmm. um, which I thought was crazy because uh, injection molding, as far as I know, it is a technique that people use when they want to make something times 100,000 or times right. 10, not right. something when you want to make 500 of them. Right. The, uh, the initial mold for that is several thousand dollars. Uh, I, ha I have a friend that worked in that, that line of business. And I remember somebody coming, uh, somebody coming to him saying, Oh, I want to build a trash can. And he said, okay, well the first trash can is going to be about $15,000. And the guy lost it, and and uh, he says, "Well, this is a trash can. This is the most expensive trash can that uh, I'll I'll ever make." And I said, "Well, the first one's fifteen thousand, and then everything else is after that is going to be much cheaper." So, uh, the the mold is certainly incredibly expensive. So I can totally understand when you guys are looking at that process, going, "Wow, that's that's a scary number to think about." It is, but so and and this is where. Vihar has been completely crucial to making it like where it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, is so I I looked at that and I thought injection molding is is really the startup costs are insane. Fifteen thousand is actually quite a quite a low number. Right, um, sure. If you're talking about high, th those are some of the cheapest molds. If you're talking about really like high Complex, volume, small pieces, and much more yeah. common and in things like um, phone cases, when they make phone cases, they make a million of them. Uh, and those right. molds are really, really expensive because they're hardened steel. Um, but a combination of make, of accepting uh, aluminium, so they use a, a, they use a softer material to make the mold, which is easier to machine. And then computer machining has made the process much cheaper in the past 20, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so actually now the molds are not affordable, but but we can do it. Like um, right. like 
and this, these models are part of why the Kickstarter goal is, is quite high. If you look at the goal of uh, negative supply or pixelated, their goals are much, were much lower. Granted, mm -hmm. they both got lots of money because they're good products, but um, mm -hmm. but their goals, because they were using different manufacturing methods initially, uh, pixelated ended up ended up doing injection molding anyway. But uh, because they were using different manufacturing methods, they um, that they had much lower goals, whereas we we have to start out quite high, quite high volume, otherwise we will just right. not be able to make it in that, in that cost. Um, but yeah, this injection molding technique was what eventually made it possible to to offer it at a price that we we are offering um, and still not be a charity, uh, because sure. we we probably have made uh, my drawings work if we were a charity, but um, we have plans for other things and um we've spent a lot of time on this so sure absolutely um, now so I, we we thought it better both for the community and for ourselves that we did actually try and make this an actual product and not a not a charity yeah no that's that's uh fantastic and I, I agree i mean you you have put a lot of time into designing something and and uh a product that is going to continue going forward uh has to be viable um, especially if you want to secure a future for it. So, um, so I, I certainly agree with you in that regards that, you know, uh, in order for, uh, Valoy to really move forward with new products, you, you have to be able to fund it. Right. And, and this design, and I've, I've heard this quite often with, um, Kickstarters is that the design that goes into the Kickstarter generally is kind of like the introduction to funding other projects that are coming down the line as well. So, so I, um, and you mentioned it, sorry, you mentioned it and I'm really excited because I kind of want to uh, ask about, you know, towards the end, uh, uh, if you have any ideas, uh, that you might be able to share, but I, I won't, I won't pressure you. So, but, um, I, I'm really interested. Um, so this design is different than some of the other products that are out there. Um, so something that really caught my eye on this was the modularity of it, right? So you can quickly connect a 35 millimeter holder, you can disconnect it and you can drop in a plate for 120. And so I really like that because, um, the other types of designs that are out there, they're fully solid units that you have to take apart, unscrew from a plate, put in a new adapter and then drop the unit inside and and they're very sturdy devices and and so um but it does it's time consuming to switch uh formats um and and i completely agree with you the scanning process because i came from an an epson v850 like the best flatbed scanner that you could possibly have on the market and i stopped using it uh when i got this camera scanning because it was it took hours, right, to scan in a roll of 35 millimeter because I had to cut it. It didn't fit on the, you know, a single roll didn't fit. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I know that pain and it was always, you know what, I'm just going to have the lab do it. Uh, and, and that got expensive very quickly. And so for me, uh, investing in something like this uh, has made scanning more enjoyable. I sold my V850, got rid of it. I don't even have it anymore. And I was concerned because I'm like, ah, you know, I have four by five. I do shoot that, but I don't shoot that as often. Um, but I do have a solution which I can do that. It is probably still faster than doing it on a flatbed. But um, I, I, I am, I completely agree. That, and that's what time is, is what you are really buying back or investing in when it comes to the, these devices and anything that can shave off time especially as quickly as you're able to pull a plate out and drop in a new uh plate that i mean that's just you know huge that's that's a huge and uh very interesting design and i and i really did uh enjoy seeing that so um what are some of the features on this that you and your team have been really proud of, right? The, the the dropping in of the plates and everything along those lines. Uh, what are some of the other features that you kind of feel like that a lot of people have not really noticed that you're like, oh my gosh, I really want 
to talk about this more so? I think some of the features are the features that are more hidden that people don't think about with these holders because that's that's a very obvious like modularity is very is very obvious um but i think one of the features that people aren't don't talk about a lot and, and aren't um isn't so obvious to see because it's inside the holder is that is that uh so so this is the, the holder mm -hmm. um and you can't see it on this but on the inside of this uh there's a track the the track that the film moves along is is s curved so it's yep. a sort of um, it bends up at both ends and that flattens the film in the middle. So if you've ever, ever tried to take a piece of film and you bend it and bend it in the lengthwise direction, uh, then try and bend it in the opposite direction at the same time. It's, it's, it doesn't really like to bend this right. way. You sort of just wrinkle it. Um, and using an S curve track, uh, like we're doing is makes, uh, just flattens the film in the middle. So it's not curved in the area you're actually scanning in. The, mm -hmm. the area you're actually scanning in is completely flat. That's the point. Uh, but it's curved outside that area. And that sort of, yeah, it flattens it mechanically. Yeah. Um, Using a little bit of physics in order to make that that plane as flat as possible for the camera to, to scan a perfectly yeah. flat surface. And it's, yeah. It's not. It's not perfect. It doesn't work uh, if you bend one thing at, at two meters, uh, six feet away from something, um, from from something else. It's not going to affect the other side of it. But it does work over a relatively short uh, area. So mm -hmm. it's it's one of the things that's helping helping this holder be make them flatter than some of the holders that don't do this. Uh, and there are there are holders that do this. Um, Negative supply ones do that. Uh, which I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I know that the uh, tracks do have some kind of motion inside of it, but I haven't. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I'm but, too afraid yeah. to open it. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's one of the the things that I've got difficult to see. I try to highlight it in the Kickstarter, and I try to talk about it as much as I can because it does. Um, I have some really curly pieces of film, and especially mm -hmm. one twenty. Um, and so I, while I was making the holders, I was testing with this really curly expired piece of Provia and, and it just, it just does not want to stay flat at all. Um, and, and that flattens pretty well, but I do have to say like, it doesn't, it isn't magic. You're not putting it between two sheets of glass. Um, right. it's, it's not going to be completely flat uh, making, right. making a curled surface completely flat without putting it between two curled surfaces is impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the sort of design that, for example, um, films, uh, what do they call them, cine scanners, the, the scanners that scan film for the cine oh, yeah. industry, yeah. They, use this, they use this sort of uh, design, uh, and it is the sort of design that you'll find in some of the professional, um, the, the sort of two, uh, early 2000s professional film scanners for, 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 for labs. Yeah. Um, so they really thought that was a good idea so i that, that's partly why well it works it really works yeah um, um yeah so that's one of the features that i think is is quite important to the holder yeah it's um, it's yeah. like one of those under the hood things that like it, i guess almost like the magic of you know you, yeah. you put it in you don't you're not actually seeing the work that's actually being done but uh yeah. you, you're sorry there's cat for flying here um, but, uh, but no, it's very interesting because I mean, it's like magic, uh, in, in a box, right. You know, you have this curve, you're kind of not looking at it, but you are entrusting that, you know, the film is going to come out as flat as possible at, uh, up at the top. Uh, and I agree. I mean, the, uh, I don't think anybody should expect, uh, the quality of a drum scanner out of this, right. You know, um, I think anybody, right. Any of the devices that are out on this market. Um, just uh, uh, drum scanning is kind of like a totally different echelon of a kind of scanning that is available. Um, but it is very, very difficult to get into, uh, that level of scanning, uh, at least price wise, right? Cause I I've seen some prices that are $35 for a, a, a single frame of 35 millimeter. I mean, that's how, how expensive because the process in order to do it is uh, laborious and, and it takes a lot of time to get into it. So this 
And I think there are some fantastic um, uh, comparison videos of the different ways of being able to scan. And um, uh, Nick Carver did a fantastic comparison of it. And he was he was even surprised by, you know, that digital scanning was a viable solution on being able to do this. So that's that's absolutely fantastic. So um, I, I want to kind of jump into the Kickstarter a little bit. So you have this product, you have this design that you are kind of in a in a happy place with at this point. And um, you said, you know, I want to I want to put this out to the world. Um, tell me what were some of the thoughts going through your head at that point like because i know making a jump like that and and you know deviating i guess in a way from what you're learning in in university right now is not anything that you know i'm sure you're taking pause and going is this what i want to do is this the path that i want to go down so tell me a little bit about like what is your commitment to this what what is um you know, are you going to make this? Or are there going to be a couple of products? And then you say, okay, done. And then let's move on to something else. Or do you think this is going to be something that you will continue down? So my, my life this year has been mostly this. If you split my life into my life and this holder, this holder is probably half of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and especially the past since the Kickstarter launched and the month before the Kickstarter launched, I... That, that was all of my life. So I think um, launching a Kickstarter is a lot of work. There's there's no way around it. There's a lot of writing. There's a lot of video. Well, the video making uh, is painful yeah. for me, at least, as can be seen. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, and getting the product, presenting the first, making the product, or making prototypes and all that stuff, but, but making drawings ready to the point where you're comfortable saying, we think this will be fine. This will be great. And finding suppliers and talking to manufacturers, can you do this? For how much can you do this? If you can't do this, well, we need to find someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and making sure they're reliable and, and doing all that. And doing that by myself as a, as a linguistic student would be madness. Um, luckily, I've I've had help from Viha, who's has experience in manufacturing, has contacts in manufacturing, and he he knows what's up basically. So he's been taking care of a lot of the manufacturing awesome. things. I've been involved in sort of I've looked at prices with him and and helped him sort out how this will work in volume um, and and do sort of the spreadsheet work. But he's been talking to manufacturers and and making sure the drawings will work. So all of that has been taken off my hands, which is completely, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been in my hands since I started the project, but then um, since he, he became part of it, it's it's been amazing. Um, that said, there's still there's still a lot of work that goes into sure. writing and communicating and doing, doing all that. Yeah. Uh, but for the post Kickstarter, I think so. Uh, right now. I'm, I'm not going to be able to, none of us are going to be able to make a living off of, um, well, I, that's, we, we won't um, mm-hmm. increase ridiculously. Um, that said, both of us are in situations where, so I'm finishing up my degree in university and I'm sort of choosing, choosing my path ahead. Um, and I have a lot of well, more flexibility in, in where I go and, and how I do things and how I set up my life for the future. Mm-hmm. And Vicho is in a similar position where he's going back to university after having worked professionally for years. He's going back to university and, and therefore has more flexibility in his life um, to continue developing stuff for my well, life. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so depending on how how we see the brand going we are able to adjust our adjust our lives and and right now it looks very good uh, and if we at this point next year see wow okay this this really took off this is enough work for at least one person then um at least one person to actually live off of it and, and actually do it properly um then then we can do that and if not then i feel we're both 
<laughs> so we, we have plans for for a lot of stuff uh, ahead. That's we have awesome. a lot of um, add-ons to the current thing, and we have a lot of plans for related things that don't go directly on this system, but they're mm. very related. Um, so regardless, and we're both very we're both doing it this in our free time. We're not um, asking anyone pay me this per hour or I won't do it. This mm. has been our pet project since since it started, and um, so it's not like this is going to, like unless this gets huge. Like I was saying, we're not we can't make a living off of it. Well, okay, fine. Um, that that's that's all right. The film market isn't that big. The film community isn't right. that big, but it does need people to invest their skills and invest their time into into making things if if it wants to get bigger and, and move forward and, and have good products like this. Um, so I think I wouldn't be too nervous about us going away anytime soon. Um, cool. Definitely not before the Kickstarter <laughs> ends. And definitely not before the- <laughs> sure. No, no. And that's, that's really cool that you guys have a roadmap for after Kickstarter, because I think um, in order to have a successful Kickstarter, you have to kind of think ahead of the curve because it's going to be much more than just this product or um, there are, there has to be additional steps uh, and additional products that should come down the line in order for it to be a success, a successful product. So um, that, that is, I'm really excited to hear that um, you guys are already thinking about and designed other potential accessories and other features that can go into this after this Kickstarter. So that's, that's really cool. Um, so I know uh, Valoy is a uh, very uh, popular in Europe right now. Um, and I know that you guys are the talk of the town, uh, but not so much uh, has been heard about you guys over here uh, in the U.S. side. So, um, so we do have a very large U.S. demographic as far as how this podcast goes and everything. And I certainly want to present this uh, platform to uh, kind of have the listeners hear about this and everything along those lines. So um, how would, um, I know that we have the Kickstarter, um, but where can uh, they find out more information about Valoy um, and are you guys shipping to the US? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So mm-hmm. we're, first, we're not trying to discriminate against the US. It's, this hasn't been, the reason we're not as heard about in the US, I think, is, is because Camera Rescue mm-hmm. and Camera Store is uh, is a partner in this project. Sure, um, and their social media only reaches so far, uh, and it's more concentrated in Europe yeah. uh, than in in the US. Um, that said, there is actually quite a lot of interest from the US, and I see, um, and I think the camera scanning market in the US is is larger than in Europe. I think there's a lot more of the sort of DIY spirit and uh, yeah. like people like doing it seems like like you like doing this thing yourself and that's that's brilliant i love it and i think most of the forums and, and knowledge about uh, about this stuff is american based which is uh, which is pretty cool um yeah so first about shipping no oh, no actually first about where you can find us um so there's a kickstarter uh the easiest way to find our kickstarter is probably finding our well so you either find our instagram which is valoy dot co um at valoi.co or you can find our website which is the same valoi.co um or you can go on kickstarter and you can look through i think we're top 47 something oh wow that's awesome (laughs) i think you can find us on the first page of kickstarter and we also got the project we love tags i think we, we should be up there on the first page yeah um yeah, so that's about where you can find us. About shipping to the US, so like I said, we're partnering with uh, Camera Store, which is a Finnish business that sells one of the uh, probably the largest uh, retailer of used camera equipment in Europe, uh, based in Finland, and they're great. And they they sell actually tested cameras, which I'm really excited about. Um, but yeah, we're partnering with them, and um, part of that is the distribution because um, I think a lot of Kickstarter have Kickstarters have run aground when it comes to shipping. Uh, mm-hmm. Shipping is 
surprisingly difficult. Logistics is surprisingly difficult. Um, so one of the things that we didn't want to do was have a pallet full of things and then go, so what do we do now? <laughs> uh, and then sure. have be run, running out of money as we were doing, sure. asking exactly the question. So what we've done is plan ahead. So you'll see on the Kickstarter when you add a pledge, it will automatically add a shipping based on where you are in the world. Uh, so in Finland, it's five euros. I'm sorry, this is going to be in euros. Don't have the US... USD. Yeah, they can figure it out. It's slightly cheaper in dollars, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's slightly more in dollars, actually. Yeah. So it's five, five euros for Finland, uh, 10 for Europe, and mm -hmm. 20 for the world. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for this is that, so those are the rates from Camera Store. We'll be shipping through Camera Store and, and using their distribution network. And they're mm -hmm. partnering with DHL, which is a, very large and, and quality service. And I think I think every day or at least every other day I see from the camera store or camera rescue uh, accounts on Instagram, they're reposting someone who's posted about DHL's shipping, which sounds a bit weird, but um, it's very freaky because DHL which will ship to you from Finland to the UK overnight. So they'll ship it, I'll order it from Finland during the day and Nuno will pack it up and ship it. And it will be with me the, the afternoon after the day after. And then to the US, I think it's two days. Um, Which is yeah. amazing, by the way. And and I, I did, for those that would want to know the number, it is current, with current exchange rates right now, it is $23.93. So yeah. uh, less than $25 yeah. uh, coming out of Europe. So that's really not a bad price, to be, yeah. in my opinion. Now, um, you said you're partnering with uh, Yuho um, and, and uh, Camera Rescue, and they are great people. I've, I've had the pleasure to speak to Yuho. Um, I, I still need to get Camera Rescue on the show. Um, uh, they are just absolutely awesome as far as what they're doing. But I, I have to compliment that you, you are working with them because of the logistics that they already have in place. And I think that is hugely beneficial because I do know over here, I, uh, I believe, um Sinistil film helped out the lab box uh with the logistics as well so it's absolutely awesome to see uh industries that that are helping other people come up and that's really really cool to see that happening and especially with DHL um I have ordered things from lenses from Japan uh from DHL and they have arrived faster than my packages from Amazon. I mean let, let, let's let's put that in during covid nonetheless. So I I hats a tip my hat to uh to uh to DHL. So I think that um uh there's certainly uh some added benefit as far as um how that is going to get shipped. So that's very very cool to hear that it's very possible in the US to get it delivered very quickly actually. Um so um now that we've talked about timing as far as shipping what is the timing for for the actual design of this product yeah so as we went live uh the the second i i clicked my i clicked the publish button on an update for camera uh, for kicks for the kickstarter so there's now a, a new uh update from the for the kickstarter and then i, I came on the podcast <laughs> so and i wrote about just that um and so because we so we just hit 90% of our goal, uh, we have, uh, yeah, about, like you said, about $8,000 to go. And it looks like we're going to hit that in probably in the next couple of weeks. So what usually happens with Kickstarters is they have a big peak at first and then they, they sort of slow off, but slow down. But it looks like we'll probably hit that um, goal in, in a couple of weeks. Things are a bit weird right now. I guess mm -hmm. this was black. Like, Yesterday was Black Friday and, yeah. and things like that, so it's strange, a bit, a bit strange. But um, it'll pick back up right before it closes off, too. So I, I know that there's a little yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. But what I was going to say was um, because we are so close to our goal now, and because we've now finally accepted, but I was I was pessimistic for a while before we launched the Kickstarter. I'm like, oh, who's gonna um, <laughs> who's gonna support us? But uh, yeah, now that we we're pretty confident that we'll be uh, will be funded, we've actually sped up the plans for 
fin finishing up everything. So there are things that need to be done, like finishing up the drawings, making the final little tiny adjustments, making proof prints, making uh, ordering prototype or ordering like final proofs of the of all the parts and all of that. Um, so we've sped up the, that process, and uh, we can we start we'll start doing well. So Bichar is moving this weekend, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is in. But as soon as he's back in in the new flat, um, we are going ahead with we're doing all the preparations. So we weren't planning on this was scheduled for after Christmas, but because we've gotten all the support um, and we think we'll get funded, we're now speeding that up. So our initial goal for shipping and what we've been saying officially has been April um, 2021. That is. Mm -hmm which sounds like a very long time away uh, but you have to take into consideration that we're making we have to make have the molds made which takes um, at least six to eight weeks minimum sure. um, with a lot of caveats for this could take longer um, sure. as as other products have experienced um, mm -hmm. so yeah we're aiming for april but because we've gotten so much early funding, um, it might be earlier. I'm not going to say we will be earlier, but yeah. it could be. Um, You're so feeling more optimistic about, about the timing of everything. We're a bit more optimistic about it now uh, <laughs> than we were a few weeks ago. <laughs> Fair. Very cool. Very cool. Well, uh, uh, our, we are getting close to time and, um, and I, I just want to say a very big congratulations to you. I know that you're not quite at the finish line just yet, but you're almost there and I'm very confident that you guys will get there. So, um, but before this, uh, this go, goes, uh, live, I just want to say a big congratulations to you. Um, I have my famous signature question that I typically ask, um, and that is, uh, what question did I not ask that you would have liked me to ask? Um, yeah, this is, is indeed a famous question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so you haven't asked me about printing at all, which is mm. ironic. Mm. We're talking about scanning all this time, but yeah. uh, I'm actually really dubbing darkroom printing. And this is something I get a lot with, uh, with people talking. Uh, I, I talk a lot about scanning, but then a lot, quite a lot of people, um, say, oh, but the film is all about darkroom printing, which is mm -hmm. which is fair. We haven't talked about darkroom printing at all, which is actually one of my one of my passions. I just uh, yesterday I was I spent five hours in the darkroom printing. Uh, this is one of the I usually hang up my oh, cool. um, hang up some of my prints when I come back from the darkroom and, and sort of look at them to for a few days. And if I I often spot something, oh, that's not right. And I go back <laughs> and I. I'm sure <laughs> fix it um so that's one of my i was printing some uh on the 16 by 20 prints on the new ilford um multi-grade five right multi -grade five yeah, yeah it's really good i printed uh i've usually stuck to fiber before but this i think i'm i think i'm converted oh uh, wow very yeah. cool it's i'm i'm actually excited to see that multi-grade five is uh hitting the market because i know that they had a lot of multi-grade four to go through before uh, the five uh, hit market. So that's really cool. Well, no, that's a very good point that you bring up. We, we, we've talked so much about scanning. Um, and I agree there is a, I guess, almost like an, uh, an, an image life cycle, I guess, you know, I hate bringing my old it stuff out in, into the picture, but, uh, I mean, it, it truly is. You, you visualize an image, you take the image, uh, you develop it. So now you have it on a piece of film. And then uh, you scan it in, we digitize it and everything along those lines. But we, we, uh, I would say a lot of it stops there. But um, uh, I think you're absolutely right. The true appreciation for an image is when it comes to print. Um, uh, because reflected light is a totally different experience than light that is passing through an image. So um, I'm, I'm really curious as far as how has your experience been going with uh, printing and um, I don't know, maybe, is there something, is there a hint with that, that might, we might see with, uh, with, uh, some printing with, uh, Valoy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't mean to put you on spot. Um, so, but you know, uh, so, but yeah, I'll let you. Uh, as a matter of fact, there, there is maybe, um, 
<laughs> so it turns out that someone someone looked at the holders and they looked at the film advancer and they said, "Wait, that's a good dark room. That's a good holder for the dark room. Those are better than mm. any holders that are all in there." code tracks and they don't have all this uh, they, they're not very good at being holders so there is there is um opportunity there nothing is there is there's been there's been many scribbles on paper oh like, very cool. well uh, then i will stop there because i don't want you to give out your idea because that's really cool and i i don't want you to uh uh give too much information but that's really cool that you're able to come up with some ideas uh with that so very fascinating so um well uh, I am really excited for you guys. Again, I can't stop congratulating you guys. And, and the reason why um, is because when we have new ingenuity that's coming to the market, um, it, it's an indicator that the market is growing. Film photography is um, uh, getting popular again. I don't think it will ever be to the size of what it used to be in the heydays in the 2000s. But... Um, I do think that um, there is a new breed of photographers that find shooting on a physical medium um, uh, to be exciting. And, and so we're now seeing new ideas that come in that once made it very difficult to enter, uh, you know, because we, we had very top brands that made entry into this market very difficult. Either they got bought out or something along those lines. They can't do that. And now we have these new brilliant minds like you and your team that are coming out and creating products for it so a big congratulations to you no no i mean that's that's i was just just agreeing with you that's that's, that's kind of why why i'm doing this or what yeah and and why we've decided so we thought about this for a lot, a lot and like why we've decided to offer this in, in in itself because it is i get a lot of questions about like entry to camera scanning because entry to scanning is all the scanning is, is can be high end, um but entry to camera scanning can also be high um and and we, that's why we, part of the reason why we decided to offer this just the holder and it is actually a really good product on its own i'm releasing some videos today about on, on the instagram about using just just the holder as a as a holder without mm -hmm. the film advance and that puts you in the market for granted with shipping uh but but 20 euros for the most basic basic holder which is yeah absolutely yeah. and 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 for for folks that um talk about the price and everything along those lines in general uh with these products is that you are investing this is a system that you are investing in um and so uh if you really value time and you want to uh, you know, scan and, you know, complete the process as quickly as possible. Um, the, you're, you're trading that a little bit for an investment. So I'm totally, uh, in agreement with what you guys are creating. And it's very awesome that you guys are creating a more, uh, affordable option for those out on the market. So big congratulations. All right, guys. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. Uh, if you are very interested in Valoi, we have a link in the description here where you can click on and go straight to their Kickstarter. Uh, you can also find them on Instagram. Where can we find you? Valoi.co. Valoi.co. Uh, so please head over there, check them out, and um, a very special congratulations to them. All right, well, that wraps up for this episode. Uh, you can find Studio C41 uh, on the interwebs. You can find us at studio.c41. You want to find me on Twitter, studio underscore c41. And also please subscribe here on the YouTube channel. And uh, that wraps it up. So until the next episode, shoot some film. Dang it. Yes. Yes.